All right, how we doing? All right, all right. You guys are my motivated third service. I appreciate that. Thank you for making the sacrifice to be here at third. Uh, a lot of other people at first service didn't get the uh, cue that they should have come to this one because we were overflowing there. So I appreciate your hardcoreness at helping us out uh, with that. Um, my name's Chris. I'm the lead pastor here and one of the elders on, at Wells Branch Community Church. And, you know, at any point you have a question. One of the things we love are questions. We love questions. We do questions. And after this, Trevor and I, he was holding my baby over there. We'll be doing a post-sermon podcast. And um, we will be uh, answering every one of your questions. So please feel free to ask uh, at any point. So if, for those of you who didn't know, I was in the military and got to serve for se- seven years. And when you encounter... Um, combat, and when you encounter like an overseas deployed life, uh, you have a lot of time to think, you have a lot of time for bad stuff to happen, you have a, and you have a overwhelming opportunities to kind of encounter death on, like, on a daily basis. And uh, one night for me, when I was in Iraq, I had uh, uh, one of my uh, platoon sergeants knocks on my door to my room where my cot was, and he's like, Sir, we just lost somebody, and it, it had been Sergeant Gibbs. He he had died, and uh, an IED had killed him. And he looks at me. He's like, "Sir, we've lost so many. Why? What are we even doing here?" The frustration was fresh, and the anger was, I mean, clear. And I, in that moment, as a 27-year-old captain in combat, trying to figure out how I should respond. I mean, I had like. You know, you have like a zillion answers go through your mind all at the same time. Um, it, in a, it's amazing how the brain works. But in like a, like a millisecond, I thought about Middle, Middle Eastern diplomacy and how that's always been a failure. Then I thought about George Bush. And then I thought about the colonel and then the generals and the way we were handling things and doing things. And then eventually it just it clicked. I was like, hey, listen, Sergeant Kiss, there's something wrong with the human condition. It's why... Uh, Nations go to war, it's why people get divorced, and it's ultimately why people die. Um, There's something wrong, there's something broken. I said Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and he died on a cross, and then he rose to the dead, and when he died, he died for all our sin, and then when he rose, he proved that he defeated death, and that if we just trust him, uh, he would give us his righteousness, and he looks at me, and he's like, that's not even what I asked. Like, sir, don't give me a fairy tale. I, want, I just want an answer to why we're dealing with all this death. And I said, oh, listen, I'm going to start praying for you. To which he was like, I guess. And then he just walks out. But I think there's just this piece of us that's come to regard the resurrection as a fairy tale. Um, and we have a tendency to view the resurrection as a fairy tale when uh, we're talking about just people who are skeptical, Right? Um, Sergeant Kish, he was skeptical. And when you're skeptical, we think that the Jesus we see portrayed today is probably the composite uh, of more than one person. And we think that the story of his life was no, about, no doubt embellished to some degree, just the same way as we got stories about, I'm sure there was King Arthur, and he eventually became the sword and the stone. And then it was, I'm sure there was Robin of Loxley, who then became Robin Hood. I mean, you have this, the reality of like people like, listen, listen, people don't, they're not raised from the dead? That's silly. And so we get skeptical. And I appreciate if, if you don't believe in Jesus or you're kind of like on the edge, you're like, I don't really know about that. I'm grateful you're here. Or how about this? Um, and this might be more of the audience we have here not here this morning, is we get busy. Um, we're working. We're trying to get ahead. We got a job to do. We got th- kids to raise. We got soccer practice to get to. I mean, there's a ton of stuff going on. The reality of our world gets so so intense. And we're just trying to raise our kids in a way that won't require extended therapy. I mean, like the whole point of our heart is that, um, I mean, who has time to think about something that happened 2,000 years ago? I need something that's going to help me in the next 10 minutes. And so we get stuck and we get distracted from what could ultimately be our purpose and our joy. Or how about this? Um, we're hopeless. We, uh, we're depressed enough as it already, and to spend time, to spend time investigating a story will only delay the inevitable hopelessness and despair of our soul. 
And so, Chris, granted, I'm sure that you believe in a God, and that's a nice little crutch you have, but I've, I don't even want to go down that road uh, because I'm just trying to make it beyond the depression of the moment. This is where a lot of us are, all right? So this morning, um, I want us to get into uh, a letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the Corinthian church, okay? And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15. If you don't have a Bible, would you mind... Uh, Raise your hand in the air, wave like you do care, a Bible will come to you. If you don't have one at all, this is our gift to you. I'm so glad you're here, and we'd love to get a copy of God's Word in your hand. Uh, And before we continue on, uh, I want us to just pray and ask God to speak to us through His Word as we investigate Him. Father, I worship You. I'm asking that Your truth would speak to us. There would be just this unbelievable clarity. God, I'm praying that there would be just deep joy. And God, I know that for some people here, this moment is the longest moment of silence they've had all week. And I know that sometimes the stress and just the struggle of trying to make it and trying to just live out an American life here in Austin, Texas is hard. And so God, I pray that your word would give life to tired souls and there'd be an inspiration and a joy to go and live for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Okay, here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 1. That's on page 961, the Bibles we passed out. Uh, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, and if you didn't know this, gospel just simply means good news, uh, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now, <clears throat> if you're a Bible person, I need you to highlight what I also received. This is important. You see, because of what's about to follow is a creedal statement. Now, what reason, or the way that legends happen is that a bunch of people will recount different stories of a, a true person, and then it gets embellished over time. You know, it starts out as... Uh, he was a good man till he was a knight, till he was actually a knight with a sword, to he was a knight with a sword who battled dragons. That's sort of how it happens. But if you create a creed about something within really the first 20 years, you don't get to get to this generational uh, legend making, but rather something happens where uh, you, you get to um, convey truth of what it is that you believe. Now, what's interesting about this is that the church was planted in Corinth in 49 A.D., Let's do some math. Jesus rose from the dead in 33 AD. Paul planted the church in 49 AD. Quick math, you only have to go to UT to know this. That's 16 years. And so in 16 years, a formulaic statement had arisen that everybody agreed on, and it was this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. All right, now if you're, so that, like, that's a formulaic statement. Notice in accordance with the Scriptures, in accordance with the Scriptures, it's sort of sandwiched in there. And then he buried, died, buried, raised. That, that's the gospel. And everybody knew this. Within, and this is a thousand miles from where the gospel started. It wasn't a thousand miles by way of I-35, so you end up in Minnesota. It was a thousand miles by what, some cruddy roads or maybe going across the Mediterranean Sea. And then he appeared to Cephas. Now, Cephas, if you're wondering who Cephas is or Cephas, that's Aramaic for Peter, which is really Aramaic for Rocky, and Peter is Greek for Rocky. There you go. So you've got this like reality that this formula, this creedal formula has been passed down. So here it's clear that this was not some legend that was built over time, but rather it was a statement that really hit to what everyone believed. Now, verse 6, then he appeared to more than uh, 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Now, I love when it says this because it just cracks me up. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Now, the thing you may not know about James is he is uh, the oldest, younger brother of Jesus. And so imagine being James and having Jesus as your older brother. I mean, just, just go with me for a second. You've got Mary. She's like, you know, James, if you could just be more like your older brother, Jesus. 
And then James would be like, oh, gosh, man. Jesus, it's like you got a God pump complex. Do you ever do anything wrong? You're always doing right. Always remind us how we should always obey, Mom. And then, you know, the, the funny part for me is I, I could just see this. And I, I'm sure this isn't how it went down, you know, because James and all the brothers, actually in Mark, they take Jesus to go, you know, they think he's crazy because he starts saying all these things like, I'm God, I'm God, you know, you know, I, I'm the Word of God, I forgive sins, all that sort of stuff. And they try and take him away to a, a padded place with people in white coats, and he won't go. But the, he's convinced he's crazy, and he sort of mocks him at one point in the Gospels. Now, if I were Jesus, and I was going to come back and reveal myself to James, it would go something like this. What's up, sucker? I'm back. You know, I, that to me would be how it would happen. Uh, and of course, he's Jesus, so he probably did it perfectly. He's like, James, it's cool. Give me a hug. And James is like bawling his eyes out. I'm, a wor- I'm worthy, whatever he says. Uh, I should have known. Sorry about that. All those times I made fun of you. Anyway. All right. So then he, he appears to James and all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, Paul, he's a guy that literally systematically killed off Christians. He would get letters from the high priest uh, of, you know, of Judaism, and he'd say, listen, I'm going to go to the city. Um, I'm going to get some people around. They'll protect me. No one, Rome doesn't have to know. We'll just throw big rocks into their head until um, they're dead. And we're going to keep this thing moving. We will stamp out this thing of Christianity. And so he does. And then he's met. Now watch this, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the, contra- on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, meaning James, the apostles, uh, everybody else, Peter. Uh, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed when we planted this church five years ago. That's what he's saying. Now, eyewitnesses make the resurrection more than a fairy tale. Now, this is, what's important here is, listen, I need you to hear this. James, Peter, and Paul, and the apostles would all die for their faith. Now, listen, people die all the time for stuff they believe in. People fly airplanes into trade towers for stuff they believe in, but they died for what they witnessed, not for what they believed, for what they saw. It's a totally different story because remember, they, these guys have writings that are within uh, uh, several years of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so Within 15 years, you've got churches planted all over the place. It's not like Corinth was the, was the first church. It was one of many churches. And so this is huge. So you've got this saying. Now, here's the thing. You, you look at this and you'd say, okay, let's look at, let's look at some of these people and go, what would their motivation be to convert to Christianity and spread it across the Mediterranean seaboard? What would Paul's motivation be? The only thing that Paul gained, because remember, because if you're going to make this up and then you're going to go die for it, there should be something that you gain, like money, fame, women, power, something. But all that Paul got for leaving a cush job as a guy that went around killing off Christians and persecuting Christians, believing zealously that he was doing God's work, the only thing he got was hardship, imprisonment, and death by his conversion to Christianity. And so, and, and again, remember, what made this thing of church planting happen? Like, there wasn't a thing of like, Fran, like you didn't go to In-N-Out Burger from California, bring it to the U.S., or bring it to Texas, which is the U.S., I guess. Uh, didn't, wouldn't bring it from California to Texas and start it here unless franchising was a thing. It was an opportunity to make something more of yourself. But all Paul got was more persecution by traveling thousands of miles and getting shipwrecked and bitten by snakes and stoned to death and all sorts of awful things happened to him. So why would he franchise the very thing he tried to stop? Okay, and you're like, all right, I'll give you Paul. Paul was just, he felt guilty for killing all the Christians, so he said, if if I have to kill them, I'll be one. Maybe. So, but then you'd say, what about this guy? Nah. Man, that didn't work. (laughs) 
Let's go back one slide. <laughs> so what about this guy? Peter was the leader of the church. And um, if you're going to think of a story, if you're going to create a legend about somebody, wouldn't you want to make Peter be like the ultimate guy? Uh, I mean, let's think about state-run media. All right, let's go, let's go there for a second. Um, let's think of some fun heroes of other countries that have some sweet state-run media. Putin. There's a fun one. So if you're Putin and you were head of the KGB at one time, nobody says anything bad about you in public, ever. Uh, no, you don't have any bad tweets from your own countrymen, and if you do, then you get hacked, and then you're just sort of like erased. They just dis- those people disappear. Uh, but what you do have about Putin is he rides bare-chested on uh, horses and bears and unicorns for all that. I mean, he is like amazing. How about this? How about this? Kim Jong-il. Nobody says anything bad about Kim Jong-il and then lives to tell about it, right? I mean, like you're, you don't hang out in North Korea and go, nah, I don't think you guys have got this. They control the narrative because controlling the narratives is how they maintain power. Now, watch. If you're Peter, wouldn't you kind of want your narrative controlled if it all was based upon you and your leadership? especially if you're getting people to believe in something that they can't see and won't be able to see. And so if you're Peter, in the age, bef- what's funny about Peter, in the age before social media, and we're talking like epics before social media, Peter had all of his flaws exposed, especially this point. Remember this? This is Peter where he's uh, following Jesus and Jesus is being tried. And there's this, there's people say, aren't you with Jesus? Like, no, 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 no. And eventually a middle school girl, and this is what this picture depicts. She points at him and goes, you were with one of them too, weren't you? And he, Peter, does something crazy. He starts calling down curses on himself. He is like, like emphatically done. He's like, bull, blankety blank. I don't know, blankety blank him. Curse me. You may curse my soul if I even know him. I don't know him. That one's the one you want to keep buried. Like, you don't bring that one up. You don't talk about that with your friends, especially if he's the leader of the church, and you're like, eh, you know, we follow Peter, and he believed that Jesus rose to the dead. Well, what about this one time when he didn't? But, or how about this? You're like, okay, that was, a, that was before Jesus rose to the dead. You could see how that could happen. What about this? Do you guys remember when Peter and Paul had, a, like, an outright argument in front of everybody? Here's what happened. You've got Peter, you know, he, he's the guy that said that the gospel is for not only the Jews, but for the Gentiles also. And then they're having like this mixed party, like Jews and Gentiles are at the party. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Jesus' oldest younger brother, James, walks in and Peter gets a little nervous because he likes to impress James because he's got bloodline tie. And so there's Peter. He's like, hey, um, I'm going to go sit over here with all the Jewish people, Gentile people, because I'm feeling awkward right now. And then Paul calls him out and he goes, you're a hypocrite, which to which everybody's like, wow, even Peter? Like, oh, I guess that just comes with the territory. The reality is that, I love this about Peter, his life didn't impact the truth of the gospel. Because even though he had moments of being a hypocrite, even though he had moments of having to be called out, In fact, isn't that the heart of the gospel? The heart of the gospel that Jesus rose from the dead so we're free to mess up. Not that we're going to go out and try and mess up, but we're free from the the sin and darkness and the slave to try and be an exhausting ourselves to live the perfect life. But the perfect life was lived for us. And so even Peter could go like, I blew it. In fact, he would write later in a in uh, his last letter that he and Paul not only reconciled, but he was recommending, listen to Paul. He knows what he's talking about. But again, what was Peter's motivation for promoting Christianity across the Mediterranean seaboard? Because he only gained hardship, imprisonment, and death by his conversion and proclamation of Christ. And his flaws were on full public display because his life had no effect on the truth of the gospel. In fact, I think it further emphasized it. Now, some of you are like, all right, I got it, I got it, you know, Thank you, Chris. I'm not a skeptic. Listen, I'm just busy, and I'm sure that the resurrection is important uh, for a theological framework for you preacher people. But I mean, how does that really impact my life? In fact, when I was um, when I was in college, uh, I was at West Point, and uh, it was a very academically rigorous pr- place. And so I had a roommate. I'll never forget my roommate Hayward, and he would read his Bible. 
And I'd be like, why are you doing that? Like, don't you have actual homework? Don't you have actual stuff you need to be doing? And he said, this is the most important thing I can do. My life isn't run by homework. I'm like, well, my life is. I got a lot of homework to do, and I'm actually upset at you that you're not doing some sort of miserable work right now. I mean, I actually got irritated at him because he wasn't miserable enough. And so what happened is I was like, listen, I, I, Jesus, I, I'm for Jesus. Jesus is my way to heaven, but, you know, and I think he's just my way to heaven. Any, you can get to heaven by any way. To which he's like, no, that's just silly. And then he emphasized this. <clears throat> Do you remember when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he's like, uh, he's praying. And he goes to God and he says, God, not my will, but uh, could you take this cup from me? If there's any other way, not my will, but yours be done. But God, I'm asking, I'm pleading, I'm saying, please, can we do this some other way? And God told Jesus, no. There was no other way. We need the resurrection. And then th this is where Paul's going to get into it. Watch this, verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even... Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He didn't raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope only in this, in this life only, we are of all people mo most to be pitied. <coughs> Here's what I love about this. In other words, he's saying Christianity is a, the lamest hobby on the planet if the dead are not raised. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, you have a really weird and bizarre hobby around a guy that isn't even, around a guy who rose from the dead, but he didn't actually raise from the dead, and who just taught a lot of stuff about how he was God. I mean, this gets to the place, if he's not raised from the dead, he's, here's a man walking around claiming to be God, and we're just sort of going with it. Third of the world. Yeah, sounds good. Let's worship him. That's lunacy. That's not, that's not respectable. That's not even good morals. That's insane. Hence, we're of all people most to be pitied. And then look at this, skip down to verse 32. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, Paul writes, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. In other words, if I got into the Colosseum and I battled some beasts and I won, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. This is the original YOLO. That's where that came from. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor. Now, this is huge. I think this is the part where... Um, I don't think any of us are like, I wasn't in a drunk, I'm here at church, what are you talking about? Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So at this church, people were saying, listen, we don't need the resurrection. We got stuff to do, we got parties to plan, and listen, we got some great, you know, new moral things to live by, and they're healthy things, I mean, they're good things, and um, let's just, let's live it. We got some work to do, money to make, and you know, entrepreneurialism to, to encounter. But here's the problem is at the end of it, it all comes to nothing. And what happens, can, I just, can we just be honest? If we take a look at our life, a lot of our life is just filling it with stuff. When I was, uh, when I was in high school um, and then later in college, I kind of spent my my time trying to fill my life with a relationship to fill the void. It, like the harder I worked, the more achievement that I got, the better I felt for a second. And then I felt like I got to do it all over again. Achievement is just one, I'm just one step short of achievement. I got to get after this thing. I got to keep pushing myself. But the reality of that is it's so empty. And what I found even in Iraq is that guys would let, try to f let the time pass with, by playing <laughs> like Call of Duty while they're doing Call of Duty in real life. It was sort of a bizarre thing. But you sort just kind of make yourself into a, just a, a stupor or like a distraction from any sort of pain. If I can numb myself to the pain or numb myself to the reality of my soul, because if we take time to stop, we might look into the void and despair that is 
life and start asking questions like, what am I doing here? What's the meaning of this? And have I even made a difference? And this happens when you achieve something. When I earned a ranger tab in the army, I thought I'd finally arrived. And all of a sudden you're like, that's it? There's nothing other than that's, that's it? Or if you don't make it, there's this constant sense of failure and hopelessness that sort of surrounds you. And that's why it comes back to Christianity is a fairy tale without the resurrection. And so this thing of like our pursuit of career, pursuit of living up to expectations, all of that is just distraction from facing the question of what are we here for? Now, here's what happens. And I think this is where, for a lot of us, we get busy and then sin and darkness and the stuff we don't like to talk about creeps into our lives. And here's, here's how this works. Uh, you, you didn't mean to go searching for porn, but you did. It somehow hopped on your computer and then all of a sudden you get addicted. And then all of a sudden now you feel like blackballed from Jesus. Like, uh, or like you're in financial stress or you're in relational stress and now it's like, I need... I need Jesus here. I need something. And what happens is that we get to this place of, of darkness, and it feels like asking Jesus for help. It's kind of like asking an ex-girlfriend to give you a ride to prom, right? It's like, we have, hey, honey, can, can you give me a ride? I got a new girlfriend, and uh, can you give us a ride? And you feel guilty and weird about it. So coming back to Jesus saying, help me with my darkness, help me with my sin, it feels like that's wrong because you just feel guilty all the time when you're around, which is why a lot of people just don't end up at church. And what he's saying, what, what happens is, what Christianity does is free us from the hypocrisy because there's no longer a fear of trying to look a certain way in front of people. There's, there's no longer a fear of like, I can, I, I can be fully known and people will love me with all my weaknesses anyway. Otherwise, you're left with trying to make it all count. So here, back in high school, like, remember I had issues. And um, I, was, I was about to graduate, and I loved high school. Can I just say I loved it? I know some people hated high school. I loved it. It was like life. I remember sitting there second semester, senior year, going, life doesn't get any better than this. And uh, I, I found a freshman girl, and I said, listen, Tara, um, you think I'm cool, right? And she's like, because I was 18, 14. I was cool. I said, listen, your job when you come back as a sophomore is to tell the whole school about me, all right? So you need to go over. I was National Honor Society. Write this down. National Honor Society president. Okay, that's good. Uh, I was a, uh, on the, I was pep rally leader. Remember that? Awesome times at the pep rally. You need to tell, tell everybody about that. And I'll give you, a, I'll cue you on different days to remind people. And I'll, don't forget varsity basketball. We're going to leave out the part where I rode the pine the whole year. But I was on varsity for two years. And so I would get, I, I, I would prep her, and like her role was that she would promise to tell the story of how cool I was because nobody cared. And that was so depressing to, to realize. I almost felt like this great despair as I was graduating high school, and that it's all gone. It's like Rico from. Uh, pulling dynamite, all right? So like this, this piece of me was just sort of desperate to kind of create something. Now watch this. This is where the reality is our hope can't be in this life. Otherwise, we're just going to be in despair. But watch this. Verse 50. I love verse 50 because this is like what you would read at a funeral because your hope's not here. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Verse 53. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? It's this kind of cry of uh, Isaiah 25, 8, that, that one day Jesus is going to come and he's going to swallow up. Death will be swallowed up. There will be no more tears. All the pain will end. And then to Hosea 13, it's like a mocking of like death's claim on people's souls. Um, about a week and a half ago, my grandfather died. And so I went up last week and did the um, funeral. And, uh, you know, at, 
at the funeral, you had the pictures, like, you know, the, someone's life from, you know, when they're babies. And I was like, wow, I can't believe they had cameras back then. That was, like, amazing that I could see him as a baby. And then what was crazy is that my uncle took a picture of my grandfather who died of dementia about, um, he took the picture about two days before he died. And uh, it looked like someone who had dementia. His, he had lost a ton of weight. He was under 100 pounds. And he's 95 years old. And I was like, oh, you see, this verse gets power when it meets somebody who's really dead. But death is swallowed up. And for those who didn't believe, it was such a, fa- I remember some of our family that didn't, doesn't know Jesus goes, isn't this such a horrible thing? I don't want to remember him that way. And I'm like, he's not that way. That's not, that's not him. I mean, that's his body, but he's a soul with a body, not a body with a soul. And he is now with Jesus because death is swallowed up. And there's joy awaiting him. And here's the reality that every one of us is going to end up like my grandfather. You may not have dementia, but you're going to end up six feet under or dust. And you're going to be cremated unless Jesus comes back early or on time. Because <laughs> I think that's where we go, right? This piece of like, we need to under- wrap our head around that, that death is coming, but we have a way out. We have something far greater. Our hope is it in this life and what we can get out of it, and we don't despair. The sting of death, verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. Don't let your faith flop. Trust Him. He's raised from the dead. You've seen too much. And I think if you've been a Christian for any extent, period of time, you've seen prayers answered. You've seen God work. There is this power that He is, that is, we've experienced. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Fairy tales have an ending. Man, boom. More battery power. Thank you. Fairy tales have an ending, uh, but resurrection is our beginning. Now, do you guys remember Sergeant Kish? So Sergeant Kish was um, in despair. He left my, my room that night. And the next morning, I went to uh, the chapel. And in the chapel, I'd take two chairs. I'd take one, I'd sit it across from me, and I'd sit in it. And uh, I would say, Jesus, would you please sit down and let's just talk. This is kind of my way of a quiet time. And I'd like, here, I don't know if you noticed, but um, Sergeant Kishbaugh came by last night. Remember that? And, uh, you know, we were talking about you. And so if you could do that thing that you do when you reveal yourself to him, um, that would be great. Would you open up his heart? And then the next morning, day two of that, I'd be like, hey, uh, Jesus, two days ago, Sergeant Kish, let's go over this again. You're the one working on them. I delivered the message. Now it's your turn. Day three, day four, please, Jesus, please, Jesus, you know, every day coming, sitting down, saying, would you please do a work? Day 10, Jesus, um, remember 10 days ago, Sergeant Kishbaugh, can you please do that thing? Reveal yourself to him. Open up his heart. Help him come to believe. Day 11, day 12, day 13, day 14, God, please, I'm begging for you that you would show up in Sergeant Kishbaugh's life. Would you reveal yourself to him? Would he open up his heart, open up his mind to experience who you are? And then that night, um, he came by my cot. And this time he wasn't knocking, he just sort of blew open the door. He's like, <sighs> and he's like, I'll never forget this. Uh, you know, because he's a soldier, and soldiers use soldierly language, which isn't exactly, you know, church appropriate. And he goes, um, if this S is real, then I'm effed. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I just watched the Passion of the Christ. And I was like, yeah, if it's true that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and then rose from the dead, and you don't believe it, you're, you're in trouble. He goes, what if I start sinning again? What if I start cussing again? What if I start drinking again? What if I watch some porn? And he just kind of went through a litany of it. I said, stop, stop, stop. Listen, the gospel isn't about making bad people better. It's about making dead people alive. And once you come to faith in Christ, he starts to change you from the inside 
out. And so through tears, he stepped over that line of faith, and so much so that even um, about a month and change later, when an RPG slammed in the side of his tank and he got shrapnel up underneath uh, his flak fest, he was able to say this as he's being evacuated. He's like, sir, I don't know why this is happening, but I know God has a plan, and I know he's got this thing working out for me. It was this beautiful thing. And he would live. I mean, he was fine. He would get back in hospital, rehab. He's fine. But here's the thing I want you to see is that God was working in something in Sergeant Kishba's life. And I'm wondering if this morning that God could be working something in yours. And so this morning, um, I want to ask the question and help me out on that last slide. Will the resurrection impact you more than a fairy tale? That's my question for you this morning. Will it impact you more than the fairy tale? And you guys, when you guys came in, uh, you guys got a little connection card. And if you're just kind of, I don't know where you're at. Fill this out. If you want to receive Jesus as your Savior today, like you're thinking maybe this is, you're done being a skeptic. You're ready to take that leap of faith. Or you're done just being busy and not thinking about it. Or you want purpose for the first time. Let us know. Check, I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. Or maybe baptism, or you want to get involved in anything. This is what you, where you do it. We would love to get connected with you. We believe wholeheartedly in that. And this morning, um, we're going to celebrate someone who has done that. We're going to be celebrating Melanie. We're pretty pumped about her. She's getting baptized. And that's an amazing thing that you guys get to experience. I'm so excited about that. And uh, the Lord has worked something really powerful. And so this morning, as we pray and as we close, I want us to wrap our head around what Jesus has done for us. And then I want you to answer the question, how will that impact my If you're not a Christian, this might be the day that you step over that line of faith and say, I believe. Because that's my hope. And that's my heart for you. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm, I'm so amazed by how great and how good you are. That you died on that cross and you rose from the dead. And Jesus, you saved me. I'm, I'm here today not because... Uh, this seemed like a good idea way to make friends or I just needed a hobby but you saved me to transform my life and you did and so God I'm praying that if somebody here doesn't know you or they're lost or they're just kind of their way got tripped up God would they simply just simply pray I have them pray Jesus I believe I'm a sinner but Jesus you died for me you rose from the dead Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Make me the person you want me to be. God, I'm praying that somebody would pray that and has prayed that this morning over and over again. God, open up our hearts. God, I pray for our Christians here that have gotten busy. So busy we've forgotten that the resurrection not only has implications for our work and our job and our life and our family and our marriage, it is our life. Our life is just such a smidgen here, God. Let us not lose sight of the fact we're going to spend far more years on the other side of eternity, on the other side of our grave than we are on this one. Lord, my heart's cry is that we would have a, a true view and deep joy in you of what you did and what you're going to do in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray.